evening, everyone. Welcome to our final installment of our five-part series on the Holy Spirit. This uh, talk being on the charisms of the Holy Spirit. I'm very excited to be here. We're going to pause for just a little bit, give people a few moments uh, to see that the feed has started and get logged in. And then in a minute or so, we will begin with our lecture for tonight. get started momentarily. I'm trying to pull it up on my iPad so I have that available for questions at the end. And of course it's not complying with me at all, which is very unfortunately. Oh, there we go. Okay. So here I am. Good. Well, that's the first step at least. Although my feed is about a minute delayed behind everyone else, but oh well. Okay, well I've given a little time. Hopefully those who are joining have joined in. And um, here we go. I think it's time to, uh, to begin. So let's start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Come Holy Spirit, shower down upon us anew your many gifts. Manifest in our lives your many fruits and disperse to us and through us your many charisms so that we might both be made holy and be vehicles of your holiness in the lives of others and in the church and in the world. Enlighten our minds and our hearts this night and always, and lead and guide us into all truth, into all love, into all service. And we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as I said right at the beginning, um, I'm really excited to be doing this talk on the charisms of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I think it should be a fun, a fun one to do. So I'd like to start off with just a couple uh, passages from the New Testament, probably familiar uh, to some, uh, perhaps to many of you, but very important ones for beginning to orient ourselves to the topic of the charisms. This first one is from uh, the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be uninformed. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of workings, but it is the same God who inspires them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to the utter to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, 
and to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. All these are inspired by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And also from St. Paul, this from uh, the letter to the Romans, uh, it's uh, chapter 12, beginning around verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service, in our serving, he who teaches, in his teaching, he who exhorts, in his exhortation, he who contributes, in his liberality, he who gives aid, with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. Today's talk is really about uh, the amazing goodness of the Holy Spirit and the many sorts of gifts in the broad sense of that word that he lavishes on the faithful. And so my general plan, so you have a mental picture for the talk this evening, to start out with what are charisms of the Holy Spirit, uh, to give a very, very abbreviated uh, historical not even a survey, but just a couple historical mentions of the charisms, uh, then to talk about how they are different from the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, then how the individual charisms are different from the hierarchic gifts or the hierarchic charisms. We'll talk in terms of the charis charisms about who receives them and when, um, who judges them, what are their primary divisions? And then finally, at the end, focus on the specifics of some of both the extraordinary and the more ordinary charisms of our Christian life. Okay. So what are the charisms? Um, the beginning of our answer is found really in the voice of the Lord calling to each of us. St. John Paul II wrote in Pastoros Davo Vobis, God with his call reaches the heart of each individual, and the Spirit, who abides deep within each disciple, gives himself to each Christian with different charisms and special signs. Each person, therefore, must be helped to embrace the gifts entrusted to him as a completely unique person and to hear the words which the Spirit of God personally addresses to him. So these charisms are something that come to us and have their origin in the Holy Spirit speaking to each of us as individuals, knowing us perfectly as individuals, and you might say speaking uh, certain gifts into our, our lives as a result. And then to go to the Second Vatican Council from Lumen Gentium, the great dogmatic constitution on the church, chapter 12 of that document uh, speaks this way. It is not only through the sacraments and the ministrations of the church that the Holy Spirit makes holy the people of God, leads them and enriches them with his virtues. Allotting his gifts accordingly as he wills, he also distributes special graces among the faithful of every rank. 
by these gifts, he makes them fit and ready to undertake the various tasks and offices for the renewal and building up of the church. As it is written, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Whether these charisms be very remarkable or more simple and widely diffused, they are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation since they are fitting and useful for the needs of the church. So again, these are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, as it says, to every member of the people of God, those of every rank, of every position, of every state in life. Charisms are given to absolutely everyone. We also have this kind of a similar idea. This is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 799 paragraph, I should say, number 799. Whether extraordinary or simple and humble, charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit which directly or indirectly benefit the Church, ordered as they are to her building up to the good of men and to the needs of the world. And so again, these are special graces, some extraordinary, some seemingly more ordinary, given for the purpose of building up the church, and indeed in the broader sense, you might say building up the human family, building up the good of the world. Is this a new thing that maybe only in recent years, since I've been quoting <clears throat> everything I've, I've quoted so far, uh, dates to you know, the 1960s or later, someone might wonder, is this kind of a new thing that we've just uh, recently begun to, to think about or understand? But the answer is, is absolutely not. The awareness of these, as if the, the uh, readings from St. Paul were not clear enough, go back to the earliest ages of the church. Uh, Tertullian, uh, somewhere around the year uh, AD 200, give or take, addressing adults who were about to be baptized, said this to them. Therefore, you blessed ones, for whom the grace of God is waiting, when you come up from the most sacred bath of the new birth, when you spread out your hands for the first time in your mother's house with your brethren, Tertullian says to them, ask your father, ask your Lord for the special gift of his inheritance, the distributed charisms, which form an additional underlying feature of your baptism. Ask, he says, and you shall receive. What an image, 200 AD, just really a few generations after the death of the last apostle. And here you have this towering figure of church history addressing these adults seemingly imminently about to be baptized and saying, when you come up out of the waters of baptism, almost the first thing you should do is ask God to share these charisms, these special gifts with you. And then Cyril of Jerusalem, now about 350 AD, a little later, but still quite early, again addressing adults about to be baptized at the Easter Vigil. Consider, I pray, of every nation all over the world, bishops, presbyters, deacons, hermits, virgins, and laity, and behold their great protector, the Holy Spirit, and the dispenser of their gifts, how throughout the world he gives to one chastity, to another perpetual virginity, to another almsgiving, to another voluntary poverty, to another the power of repelling hostile spirits. For it is one in the same Holy Spirit 
who divides his gifts to every man severally as he wills, himself all the while remaining undivided. Again, the sense of in the early centuries of the church, this awareness of the Holy Spirit and, and what the Holy Spirit can bring. Um, and yet, by the late 300s, really 50 years after the quote I just read, um, seemingly already you had a, another saint, St. John Chrysostom, who was lamenting the fact it seems these charisms were disappearing. He says this, For in truth, the church, he's referring to the earlier days of the church, was a heaven then, the spirit governing all things and moving each one. But now we retain only the symbols of those gifts. But the present church is like a woman who has fallen from her former prosperous days, and in many respects retains the symbols only of that ancient prosperity, displaying indeed the repositories of her golden ornaments, but bereft of her wealth. Such a one does the present church resemble. And so it seems that this kind of incredible manifestation of the charisms that seem to characterize the early church, you know, as soon as the church began to become a little more institutionalized, seemingly these charisms lessened, or our awareness of them lessened. Um, and so that's a little bit of the history, and now I want to really start jumping in understanding what these things are. So what are the charisms? Um, and the first question I, I need to deal with is how are these different from the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Remember two weeks ago, I gave that uh, really boring uh, talk on the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some of you might remember it. Maybe many of you have forgotten already, for which you can be forgiven. Um, but how are these different from the seven gifts? And again, I've used, been using these word gifts a lot, and um, I think it's important to clarify here the terminology because otherwise it can get complicated. And to do it, I'm using an example from the South, which is not where I'm from. Um, but I've met people from the South, and those of you who know people from the South or have lived in the South know that the term they often use in large swath, swaths of the South part of this country for any kind of um, soda or carbonated beverage is Coke, right? They, they use that term to apply to all of them. Do you want a Coke? Yeah. What kind of Coke do you want? I want a 7-Up. Now, as a northerner, that sounds bizarre. That's not how we, we talked. We know it was called pop. Um, my Illinois roots coming through. But down there, Coke is used as this generic term that applies to any kind of soda, any brand of soda, all soda is called Coke, but then of course you also have Coca-Cola, which is called Coke. So the word can either be a reference to that one specific soft drink, or it can be a reference globally to all of them. And that's the way in discussions about the Holy Spirit, often the word gift is used, or gifts. And in one sense, we can speak about basically anything the Holy Spirit brings us in this generic term, gifts. Um, but then there's another sense in which we use the term gifts very, very specifically to mean the seven um, that we talked about again two weeks ago. Um, so just to kind of keep that in mind throughout this whole talk, that, that sometimes there's a language thing going on here. So how do we distinguish the charisms as gifts in the broad sense of the Holy Spirit from the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is my only kind of somewhat tortuous Thomas Aquinas quote of this whole lecture. So Thomas says in the Summa this, And thus there is a twofold grace, one whereby man himself is united to God, and this is called sanctifying grace. The other whereby one man cooperates in leading another man to God. And this gift is called gratuitous grace. 
but whereas it is bestowed on a man not to justify himself, but rather that he may cooperate in the justification of another, it's not called sanctifying grace. And it is of this that the Apostle says, and the manifestation of the Spirit is given, etc., etc., the quote from 1 Corinthians. So in other words, Thomas is distinguishing the grace by which we, what we are given by grace that justifies or saves ourselves versus what we are given by grace so that we might share in or participate in uh, the saving, we might say, of another person. The one, the grace that comes to us uh, to save ourselves, those are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, whereas those graces, gifts given to us so that we might be more effective in helping to save another are the charisms. And so again, the seven about ourselves, about our own sanctification, our own justification, our own salvation. And as I taught two weeks ago, those who remember, all of the baptized receive these seven, the same seven, at the moment of our baptism and retain them throughout our entire life as long as we're in a state of grace. And that these are necessary for our salvation. Where there's that beautiful quote from Thomas, which I don't have it word for word in front of me, but along the lines of, none shall reach that land of the blessed except that he be moved and led there by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So now the charisms, again, are gifts given to us, again, for the sake of another. They're not necessary, properly speaking, for our own salvation. And they're not given to us for our own salvation. They're not even given to us to make us holier. They may do that if we use them well and in fidelity to God, but that's not why they are given to us. They are given to us to help us bring about God's work, his justification, holiness, sanctification, salvation in others. Whereas again, it's said in that reading from 1 Corinthians I started the talk with, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Really important phrase in that passage from St. Paul. The charisms are manifestations of the Spirit given to us for the common good. You might say the charisms are distinctly communal gifts that are given to us. Again, John Paul II, writing in Christi Fidelis Laici, his great document on the laity, says this, Whether they be exceptional and great, or simple and ordinary, the charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit that have a usefulness for the ecclesial community, ordered as they are to the building up of the church, to the well-being of humanity, and to the needs of the world. What goes along with this is since uh, the gifts in the proper sense, the seven, are necessary for salvation, all of us get them and all of us get the same seven. The charisms are not necessary for our salvation and the way they are given to us varies greatly. In fact, I think it's safe to say that no two people on the face of the earth have the exact same set of charisms given in the same way. Okay. So again, who receives these special kinds of gifts we call the charisms? Everybody, or at least everybody who's been baptized and is in a some kind of living relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, now whether everybody recognizes their charisms whether everybody uses their charisms is another story entirely, but everybody has them. Again, John Paul II in the same document on the laity. Indeed, the church is directed and guided by the Holy Spirit who lavishes diverse hierarchical and charismatic gifts on all the baptized, calling them to be each in an individual way, active and co-responsible. So, and if you're in a relationship in any way with God, with the Holy Spirit, you have charisms. 
whether you know it, whether you recognize them or use them, you have them. Okay. More on that later. So now how about this question of who judges them? And you might say, well, why? Why does anybody have to judge them? Judging is bad, right? Jesus said judging is bad. Um, tangent, can't go off on that one now. Um, but think about, th there is a danger here. Just think about even the way I read about from 1 Corinthians and Romans, those two bi uh, Bible passages at the beginning, about how um, among the charisms there were things like prophecy, speaking in tongues, um, you know, Cyril of Jerusalem talking about repelling hostile spirits, or others you may have heard of, like things like the gifts of laying on hands and miraculously healing people. These are pretty dramatic gifts. And they potentially can be misused, maybe, or faked entirely. Think about these kind of sham faith healers you might see on TV from time to time. Uh, or they can be greatly misunderstood, misinterpreted, perhaps misapplied, distorted. And so lest the faithful be actually led astray by claims people have of having, I'm a prophet, I'm the prophet of God, or I'm the healer, or whatever it might be, um, the church has an important role to play here. To go back to the catechism, this is paragraph 801, discernment of charisms is always necessary no charism is exempt from being referred and submitted to the church's pastors, the shepherds, the bishops. Their office is not indeed to extinguish the spirit, but to test all things and hold to what is good. It's drawing from a quote from 1 Thessalonians 5.21. So that all the diverse and complementary charisms work together for the common good. And similarly, John Paul II again, again in Christi Fidelis Laici. Indeed, the Synod Fathers have stated, the action of the Holy Spirit who breathes as he will is not always easily recognized or received. We know that God acts in all Christians and we are aware of the benefits that flow from charisms, both from the, for the individual and the whole community. Nevertheless, at the same time, we are also aware of the power of sin and how it can disturb and confuse the life of the faithful and of the community. For this reason, no charism dispenses a person from reference and submission to the pastors of the church. The council, that means Vatican II, clearly states, judgment as to the charism's genuineness and proper use belongs to those who preside over the church and to whose special competence it belongs not indeed to extinguish the spirit but to test all things and hold to what is good so that all the charisms might work together in their diversity and complementarity for the common good. In other words, because these are communal gifts ecclesial gifts meant for building up the body of Christ, the church, in unity. Um, the pastors, the shepherds, that means the bishops again, have a role to see that this is how they are being, you might say, deployed. And that you don't have some individual who's kind of a Yahoo cowboy who decides they're going to kind of completely go off on their own and do their own thing. So, that's kind of my, my introduction to the charisms. Now, let's really start talking about them. How are we doing? 7.30. Now we get the nitty gritty. Okay. So, there's three general categories of, of the charisms. Two of them will be very brief treatments, and then the third is the main meat of the talk here. Um, individual charisms, founding charisms, and hierarchic charisms. Um, I'm going to take those in reverse order. So the hierarchic charisms are gifts, charisms given to individuals through the hierarchic structure of the church 
because of an office they hold as a result of holy orders. Okay? If we were present together, all sitting around in the church basement, I'd ask for people to raise their hands and throw out some ideas of what these might be. I can't do that uh, easily right now, so I'll just plow ahead. But what are some of the hierarchic charisms? For example, priests, the power to forgive sins, the power to consecrate bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, uh, the charism of infallibility present in a special way in the Pope. Notice the word, the charism of infallibility. Also present in religious and priests, the charism of celibacy, which it's important to say is not something granted by holy orders. Um, rather, it's a charism that a young man approaching priesthood or male religious life or a young woman approaching religious life needs to show evidence of in their lives in order to be accepted into that state in life. Um, okay, so those are the hierarchic or gifts or the hierarchic charisms. Then uh, there's this category called founding charisms. And these are specific charisms that we can look back historically and see were given to founders of religious orders or of institutes or of major movements or something like that. Um, among the charismatic gifts freely distributed by the Holy Spirit, many are received and lived out by individuals. Okay? However, when a gift presents itself as a founding or originating charism, this requires a special recognition so that the richness it contains may be adequately articulated within the ecclesial communion and faithfully transmitted over time. This is what it means that when a, a St. Dominic or a St. Francis or a St. Ignatius of Loyola founds a religious order, they don't do it saying, I'm gonna found this order for seven and a half years, and then it's going to go out of existence. No, that there's a sense that a founding or originating charism is meant to endure through long periods of time. And as we know, some of our religious orders have, have been in existence well over a thousand years, over a millennia. It's a testimony to the power and the, the relevance of the founding charism. Um, now, it's important just to, to throw out that founding charisms, not everything, not every charism manifested in a founder is part of the founding charisms. In fact, often religious founders or movement founders had particular charisms special to them that were not part of what they handed on to their followers. So Dominic was very, St. Dominic, very famous for needing essentially no sleep. Some nights he would not sleep at all, other nights an hour, uh, but he would spend all night after walking or preaching or whatever all day long, he would spend all night in the, in the church in prayer. Um, that was specific to Dominic. I can assure you all Dominicans do not have that charism, not, not even close. Um, but Dominic was a preacher. He was the order of preachers. He founded the order of preachers and preaching for the salvation of souls drawn from a life of community and contemplation and study. That is the charism. And all Dominicans in every generation now for 800 plus years share in that. That's the founding charism of the Dominican order. So a charism of this sort typically gives birth, you might say, in some form to an institution. You consider a religious order an institution, or very relevant to our, our time today. Uh, think about uh, the great news that we recently heard of the upcoming beatification of Venerable Father Michael J. McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus. He had a special gift a charism, a founding charism to launch this order, this movement that has now continued for well over a hundred years, has over around two million members all throughout the world. Um, it's a founding charism that now all of the men who have come after and our knights share in. Okay? 
a special kind of subset of charisms. And then finally, let's talk about individual charisms. Um, which I'm going to divide into two categories, uh, but it's a very blurry line, please understand. And, and that's the extraordinary charisms versus the more ordinary charisms. Um, and I say it's a blurry line because things at the far extreme of both are pretty clear. Sometimes there's things in between, you know, is that an unusual ordinary charism or is that an ex extraordinary charism? There's no hard definition of that. Um, but be that as it may. Um, so let's start with the extraordinary charisms because these are fun. Um, they're fun to talk about, they're fun to think about. And I'll, I'll go through them briefly and then we'll get to the, the more common ones. So extraordinary charisms are, are truly unusual manifestations of divine power in an individual. Um, so much so and so extraordinary or so unusual that even a non-Catholic or a non-believer might notice and go like, whoa, what's, what, how'd you do that? What, what's going on there? Like, and, and, and really be thrown off by it. Uh, these are things like miraculous healing. You know, there are people even today who have the ability to lay hands on someone and pray over them and, and for healings to happen. Uh, it, again, it's rare. It's very rare, um, and, and uh, what should I say? It can occasionally happen as on a one-time basis, <clears throat> but there are people who seem to have this happen through them a lot, or at least with some frequency, um, where they can pray over someone and lay hands on someone. And, and, and serious physical ailments can be healed. Um, so uh, that's one example. Uh, speaking in tongues. Um, this one it maybe gets more publicity, both good and, and bad. And, and there's a couple ways this can manifest. One is um, sometimes at charismatic gatherings or prayer groups, you'll see people, and in prayer they'll be speaking out loud in prayer and, and seem to flip into a, a non-understandable language. Um, and that if that's being moved by the Holy Spirit, that that's a kind of a form of speaking in tongues. It's really, uh, it, it's them praying, just not in a language that, that's known on earth. Um, or you have examples in history of the manifestation of speaking in tongues the same way it happened at Pentecost. And that reading, that first reading we had yesterday for the Pentecost Mass, where, where after Pentecost, Peter goes out and begins to address the people. And again, they're from all these different countries, all these languages, and yet they're all hearing him speak in their own language. And there are examples of that, of, of even from our Dominican history of preachers who maybe he was a Spanish Dominican and he was sent to go do ministry in Germany um, in the medieval period. He didn't know a word of German. He'd go up in some cathedral in Germany and start speaking in Spanish and all the people there heard him in perfect German. And there's, there's multiple accounts, again, just from our Dominican history of this happening to preachers, um, and I'm sure other religious orders and so forth would have similar experiences as well. That, that's the gift of tongues. Um, and that can only be something from the Holy Spirit. Um, another one, prophecy. Um, and often, again, in English, in our common English parlance, when we think of prophecy, we think it means like foretelling the future. Um, and sometimes it can manifest that way. Think of the famous story from St. Dominic's life when the, uh, the brothers who had been out trying to beg bread for the community for the day um, uh, came back empty-handed and it was time for the main meal and there was nothing to eat at all and Dominic ordered the brethren to be seated and began saying the grace 
over meals. Just kind of a gutsy thing to do when there's no meal in front of you. Um, and as the story goes, two angels appeared carrying uh, big baskets or whatever of bread and gave a, a loaf of bread uh, to each friar who was there. Did Dominic know that was going to happen? Well, if he did, that, that was prophecy. If he knew it was by the gift of prophecy that he had foreseen what God was going to do in this situation, and thus he ordered the brethren to be seated and the, the grace before meal prayers to begin. But the other sense of prophecy is speaking, you know, in the, the, like the Old Testament sense, the prophet was someone who was the mouthpiece of God, who kind of definitively spoke the word of God. And um, St. Catherine of Siena, I think, was a prophet, had this extraordinary charisma of prophecy, where during the Avignon Papacy, she could write to the Pope and say, you know, you are my, my sweet Christ on earth, but your holiness, either you return to Rome or you're going to hell. And it wasn't like that was her reasoned opinion. She was speaking the word of God in that moment. And the Pope listened. <laughs> the Pope came back to Rome. Um, that, that's what the extraordinary charism of prophecy is. Um, other ones, levitation. Many accounts from the saints, especially religious, but not only religious, being so wrapped up in prayer that literally they would begin to float up in the air, some of them 10, 20 feet in the air, and remain there for sometimes a half hour, an hour, two hours at a time, while they were just completely wrapped in communion with God before finally lowering. By location, being in two places at once, and again, there's a lot of clear eyewitness examples of, of different saints where they were in one place and maybe having a conversation with several people. At the same time, there was someone dying three towns over, and that same saint was at their bedside, you know, giving them final kind of consoling words or whatever, with multiple witnesses seeing the saint there as well. Um, only by an extraordinary charism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the reading of souls. It was said that St. John Mary Vianney had that gift where, especially when someone would come to him in confession, he could literally see their soul and know every sin before they confessed it. And if they left something off, he would say to them, like, you haven't said everything. Um, puts a whole different take on, on confession, doesn't it? Um, um, impassibility. And this Dominic story where he was traveling, it was late at night. He, he was intending to stay at, uh, or, or visit, I should say, one of our monasteries of cloistered nuns to give them a little spiritual conference. Uh, he had been delayed in his travels. It was very late. And so the nuns had locked all the doors, turned off the lights, and all gone to bed for the night. And Dominic and his, I guess they had one or two companions with him were outside the door, and the companions were lamenting, what are we going to do? And Dominic said something like, we're going to pray. And the next moment, all three of them were inside. Like literally, they had passed, you might say, through the door um, and were standing on the inside of, of the building. And of course, they rang the bell and woke all the nuns, and the nuns all came, and he gave them a beautiful spiritual conference and exhortation. Okay. Or, um, you know, controlling or suspending the laws of nature. You know, the great story of... St. Scholastica uh, visiting her brother St. Benedict and it was getting late in the evening and Benedict needed to leave the guest house where she was to go return to the monastery proper and she wanted to continue to converse through the night about spiritual things. He adamantly said, I can't. And so she put her head down and prayed and suddenly such a violent storm broke out outside that it was impossible for Benedict to leave the building. Um, and when he asked her, you know, what have you done? She said, well, I asked you to stay and you said no. And so I asked God and he said, and he listened to me. <laughs> so anyway, these are some of the extraordinary charisms. Uh, there's others as well, but that gives a sense of how sometimes the Holy Spirit can manifest 
for very, very dramatic, dramatic ways. Then there's the ordinary charisms. And when I say that, please note that ordinary does not mean unimportant, does not mean they do less to build up the church. In fact, probably most of the building up of the church that happens in any age, in any place, uh, happens from the ordinary charisms. This means they're more subtle and perhaps more common. Um, and a little bit more about these. Uh, um, for this last section, I'm drawing a lot from a wonderful book, which I highly suggest by Sherry Waddell, W-E-D-D-E-L-L, -L, called Fruitful Discipleship. It's really almost all about the charisms of the Holy Spirit, and I draw, she has some great quotes, and I just draw a lot of the structure, even of this little last part of the talk, comes from her. So, um, what does that mean? So, charisms are, and I love how she says this, ah, very good. Charisms are supernaturally empowered graces given to apostles. Huge word there who have a mission, also a big word, to bring the presence and love of Jesus Christ to a specific setting or situation. Charisms are whole life gifts that apostles take with them everywhere they go. We are called to exercise them at work, with family and friends, and in the broader community as well as in the parish or diocese. Now here's a kicker, lay people listen. The vast majority of lay Catholics will exercise their apostolate primarily in the secular sphere. Therefore, the exercise of their charisms takes place primarily outside the Christian community. Charisms are not, for the most part, about churchy people doing churchy things in churchy situations in the church. Charisms, at least as they're bestowed on the laity, are primarily about churchy people in the world, but not of the world, transforming the world around them more and more into the image of the city of God by means of the gifts, these charisms, that have been poured forth into their lives for the sake of sanctifying others. Okay. All charisms are evangelizing in their own way because they make aspects of Jesus' redemptive work visible and accessible to others. Each charism conveys some portion of Jesus' grace and mercy to the world and points back to him. That is why even unbelievers find the fruits of charisms attractive and compelling. And then a very important idea about charisms is they are relatively stable in our lives. In most individual charisms are given to us long term. It is a way God uses you over and over again for the sake of others. Because these gifts are long term, you can recognize ongoing patterns in your life that indicate the presence of a charism. And just to clarify that charisms are not the same as our individual talents or abilities or skills that we've, we've learned or practiced or honed. Um, but charisms have an impact for the kingdom of God um, that go beyond what our natural abilities, skills, talents are able to accomplish. Often, not always, they can coincide reasonably well with natural gifts and abilities and skills we have, but their fruitfulness, one of the, uh, the characteristic aspects of our charisms, that their fruitfulness cannot be explained purely by our human talent, skill, ability, whatever. They are more fruitful 
then it would be expected based purely on the level of our skill. Okay. And again, these are received. Uh, they are never chosen. You can ask for them in prayer, but we do not choose what charisms we have. It's all from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Okay, so some of these individual charisms, um, what are they and, and how are they divided? Here's where you can maybe start thinking about your life a little bit. So Sherry has a division that I like very much of seven kind of main categories. And I'm going to go through those categories. Let's give like one or maybe two examples from each, and that'll kind of wrap it up. Um, the first she calls the pastoral charisms. And it's those things that, that focus on nurturing or feeding individuals. Um, you know, one, the charism of encouragement. Someone who has a particular gift to really build up another person, helping them to fully be who they were created to be. Um, this is kind of the classic charism of people who are known far and wide, especially as gifted spiritual directors. They have the ability to kind of both coax when they need to coax, affirm when they need to affirm, chastise when they need to chastise, but do all of it in such a way that they're building someone up and helping them to flourish to the maximum uh, of their potential in the spiritual life. Um, generally, this is a one-on-one -on -one charism, though it can, in differing ways, manifest in larger settings. Um, an example given was, if you have a priest who's preaching a homily to a church full of people, and there's someone that's like, he was speaking directly to me. Now I think all priests from time to time have the experience where someone comes up to us and says something like that. But if there's a priest that that happens to a lot, like a lot of different people with some frequency have this experience of, oh my gosh, every word of that homily was speaking to me. That might be kind of a differing manifestation of the charism of, of encouragement. Another one in this category is hospitality. And this is a really important one. Someone with a gift to really make a place for others to come, uh, either individually or in groups. Um, whether that locus is someone's home or whether it's the church basement after a parish mass or, or whatever it might be, someone with this charism has a, a unique gift from God to craft a warm, welcoming environment that draws people in, that fosters authentic relationship uh, between them and others who've been drawn into this, who are able to physically nurture, feed whatever that takes, uh, build authentic relationships and, and real spiritual companionship. Um, again, it can manifest individually. Um, you know, think of uh, in, in a home, it can manifest in a parish setting. Uh, it might manifest uh, someone who's, who's got a calling and a gift to doing ministry with immigrants to the country. That, that's a different kind of hospitality on a different level, but it's probably a manifestation of the charism of hospitality. Um, or someone who works, has a gift for working with those with, with, with mental disabilities or physical disabilities or really <coughs> anyone who finds it hard to be welcomed in our society or in parts of our society. Someone with a, a charism of hospitality is going to be such a blessing in that kind of scenario. Uh, second category, communications charisms changing lives by the way we communicate with others. Uh, evangelism, basic one, right? Someone who has a particular gift to call people into or back into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, again, this can manifest in a formal evangelization ministry, can manifest in one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, some people might do it through writing. Some people might do it as a foreign missionary in, in primarily pagan or non-Catholic or non-Christian lands. Um, then prophecy, um, 
as an ordinary charism. We're, we've already dealt with prophecy as the extraordinary, but what about prophecy as an ordinary charism? If they speak, someone has a gift for speaking a message from God uh, to someone who needs to hear it. You know, it can be a, simply a statement of truth. For example, I, I think of those who do post-abortion ministry through Project Rachel, and so many of the women who come believe they've done something unforgivable, that there's no hope for them, that God can never forgive them, can never love them, whatever. And someone who has a gift to speak the truth of God's mercy into that moment in a compelling way. And I think that would be a prophetic charism. Or it might be a call, not a, a statement of truth, but a call to action. You know, those who are really involved in the best way in social justice ministry and calling others to an awakening, calling others to uh, action when there is blatant injustice that we have the ability to address. That's a prophetic charism. Um, organizational charisms, that charisms for people that provide the backbone, the structure, the organization uh, to create thriving and stable ministries or groups or, or whatever. Um, things like administration. You know, someone with a gift of administration isn't necessarily a visionary, not necessarily an idea person, but rather those with the gift to lead people, coordinate people in a complicated task with multiple parts and multiple moving things to achieve a common end. That's the gift of administration. Or there's a, the charism of giving, um, mentioned in one of those two readings, whether it was 1 Corinthians or Romans. Those, someone called in a special way and with a special calling uh, to provide financial and material resources so that the purposes of God can be fulfilled in our world. It's manifested in people who are really visionary philanthropists who have assembled a lot of wealth not to hoard but really to ask what is the good I can put this to, to help bring about a building of the kingdom. Um, but also people who are fundraisers and development directors who maybe don't have a ton of money themselves, but have that a gift to articulate a vision about what someone who has these kinds of resources can achieve and help them to see that vision of what is capable by applying the resources to a, a task. Lifestyle charisms, and again, this is a little bit less common, but um, again, I mentioned already that like the charism of celibacy given to certain men and women um, precisely uh, for the purpose to which they are going to be called. And for those with this charism, uh, the lack of marriage, the lack of romantic relationships is not a void. Um, that doesn't mean we don't see it as a good and a beautiful thing, but the lack of it isn't this void in my life, but rather I can be joyful in that absence precisely in the freedom that it gives me to serve a different good, um, a different role in the church. Um, that's a charism of, of celibacy. Um, healing charisms. Um, here, one, I think, important one is intercessory prayer, the charism of intercessory prayer, which, again, all Christians are called to do some, some intercessory prayer. That's not unusual. Excuse me, that's not a special charism. That's just part of our Christian calling. But there's some people who have an incredible gift for sustained, intense, intercessory prayer for others. I mean, focused and often very powerful, the kind of thing where it seems even when, when the odds are, are slim, when, when this person is praying, it's like you almost just know it's going to happen. Uh, or you just have a strong sense of that. Or it happens far more often than it would for others. 
that's a special charism of intercessory prayer. Um, people who have this charism often find this kind of intense, extended praying for others to be energizing. It's not difficult, it's not this arduous task that they force themselves to do, but it's energizing. Um, you know, it can manifest, you know, in a more formal sense in those who are parts or even organizers of prayer chains or intercessory prayer groups. Um, but it also can manifest informally. You know, I think of my own Polish grandma, who at the end of her life especially would spend five, six hours a day in prayer, easily. And whole lists of people that she would pray for every single day um, and never tired of it. It was like the, the center of her life. It's a charism of intercessory prayer. Then there's the kind of understanding charisms, um, you know, which is wisdom. And again, not to be confused with the gift of wisdom, which we already talked about, or the human intellectual pursuit of wisdom, uh, but rather wisdom in, in the charism sense is a gift by which someone has an ability to find creative, we might say inspired solutions to problems. People who seem unusually brilliant at diagnosing these kinds of things. A uh, person with this charism is the person Maybe you have someone like this in your life, that when you have some sticky problem, this is always the person you go to for advice. Um, you know, someone that you go to that, that when you are looking at this problem and all you see is, is chaos and a jumble and all, all this other stuff, that this person has the ability uh, to, to see patterns. And because they can see patterns, they can understand causes, and because they can see the causes, they can give solutions and help you out of what to you seem to be a seemingly hopeless morass of, of, of whatever. Um, that's the kind of the charism of wisdom. Um, and there's finally creative charisms, uh, charisms that use creative activity for the sake of bringing beauty and goodness um, into the world, uh, the charism of music. And again, that's not saying someone who's talented in music, not the same thing. Um, the charism of music is someone who has a special gift by which one uses music um, in a powerful way, leading people to God and opening them up to the divine. Someone can be very, talented in music and not do that. And count someone can be far less objectively talented, but the way they do it just draws people to God. Um, and again, it doesn't even have to be in a church setting, though certainly sacred music has its, its own ways of doing this. But, um, you know, think of people who maybe use music in the, in the context of music therapy, um, things like that. Maybe they're ministering or doing music therapy with people who have no religious belief at all, but something about the way they're able to bring this music to whatever issues someone's struggling with, that just that, that beauty begins to open them up to the, the sense that there might be something greater. So that's just a few examples of, of a few of many examples. There's a ton more. Again, I can't recommend this book highly enough. Uh, Fruitful Discipleship. A ton more examples that she gives in all of those categories. So I just kind of scratched the surface by picking some examples from there. And finally, a last note. Um, actually, I think I'll, I'll end it there. Um, well, last thing now. Two minutes. Let's go along. Um, how do I discern my charisms? Big, huge, I can't deal with this in two minutes. But after hearing this, you might start wondering. And, and I would say after listening, finding a good listing of charisms and reading through, you might have some ideas, some things that resonate with your experience. 
and then like the second step is to really test that like in a intentional focused way if you aren't already attempt to really implement that charism in a concerted way in your life and sherry suggests at least two hours a week for a minimum of six to eight weeks in a very intentional way um, and having done that first kind of analyze your subjective experience how does it feel as i do this does it fit am i energized when i do it um, do i sense the presence of god when i'm engaged in the use of this charism in whichever way i'm manifesting it do i sense god's presence as i'm doing it she calls out the subjective evaluation then she also talks about the objective evaluation uh, first the objective effectiveness am i seeing fruitfulness right that, that the charisms are meant to be fruitful so am i actually seeing the fruitfulness of this ministry uh, or this effort or whatever i'm whatever i'm doing um, can i objectively analyze that then also objectively to get direct uh, and indirect feedback from others you know direct should be obvious if if you 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 feel you may have the charism of teaching then you get yourself in a teaching environment and then you ask those who are observing you like am i doing a good job i mean this sounds basic am i doing a good job um you know, and listen to what they say. You know, or there can be indirect, more subtle things. So again, imagine the scenario um, where someone comes up to you and they're not even a particularly close friend, say an acquaintance, and they say, you know, would you pray for me? I've got this, this big thing and I, I haven't told anyone else. You're the first person I'm telling. Why would a mere acquaintance tell you some deep thing that they haven't told anyone else unless maybe you've got the charism of intercessory prayer and somehow that person detected it and that's why they brought it to you or you know if among all of your family all of your friends it seems that everyone's first choice is to always hang out at your place I would say that's at least indirect evidence that maybe you've got the charism of hospitality not a guarantee there's no one total litmus test for any of these things but that might be pretty decent evidence you've got the charism of hospitality so in the end everyone's been given charisms i hope that you discern them welcome them with joy and put them to use building up the church and the kingdom of god amen Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If, uh, for those who are sticking around, if I can see any questions, I'm happy to uh, take some, although, you know, I, I struggle for some reason having them pop up. Wait, oh, there we go. Okay. Yes, can I post a link to the book? Um, I will do that afterwards. Um, question, can you explain further? In what more specific way how one can decipher between their gifts and the gifts that, and their gifts so that they can better bring both of them to, is that, I'm not sure, uh, Kellyanne, I, I'm missing a word in that sentence. Decipher between their gifts, I mean their gifts and their charisms. Um, so maybe uh, what I said at the very end hopefully answers that, that there's kind of a supernatural fruitfulness to it that goes beyond what mere gift or ability or talent would suggest. And it also brings with it, in the one doing it, a profound sense of joy and of God's presence. Um, and again, some objective standards of, of fruitfulness. Okay, if, if I need to go into more of that. Um, do you think these charisms are not popular in the traditional church, seen as too charismatic or too lay-based? As a pastor, have you seen any gifts in people with a sense that they are God's gifts to you? So why do, yeah, why do we not? I'd say a couple things. Um, 
first I think, and this is why I know one of my soapbox things I say a lot, I just think as Catholics today, we don't think about the Holy Spirit much at all. You know, he gets 24 hours around Pentecost, and, and for a lot of Catholics, that's really it. You know, unless they attend a confirmation at some point during the year, that's kind of all people think about the Holy Spirit. So it seems to me that if that assertion is true, and I, I might have someone to argue with it, but I think it's true in my own experience of people I've met, that if we are, generally speaking, neglectful of the Holy Spirit uh, as compared to the other two persons of the Trinity, um, then... I'm not shocked that as part of having poorly developed that relationship with the Holy Spirit, that Catholics of today would be less aware of their charisms, less open perhaps to their charisms, um, and, and less comfortable talking or even thinking about charisms in that sense. So I think that's part of it. Um, I do think that uh, without, it's, I don't want to draw too many broad stereotypes, but I, I will say that um, one of the great graces of the Second Vatican Council is, has been a renewed understanding of the role of the laity um, in the church. And that while it seems to us maybe that the Second Vatican Council was a long time ago, um, it was, you know, what, roughly 50 years? A little over 50 years. Um, which in, in on the time span of the church is very, very recent. Um, and so I think this idea of this understanding of the flourishing of the, the, the charisms of the laity, laity and the role there to play in the church that we're still in some ways in the baby steps of, of really flushing that out. You know, they say, it's a saying, it takes a hundred years to implement a council or to see the actual fruit of a council. So if we're about 60 years in here, 50 to 60 years, then we've probably got another 50, 40 to 50 years before maybe all of this will really kind of, you know, in, in a full way, kind of kick in. Um, so, so I think that's that. There is another part. Wait, another part of it. Um, oh yeah, and have I seen it in people? Oh, definitely. There, there's people that have um, gifts, and, and you can see again. I should I shouldn't say like this is some definitive like like priests have this magic you know, sensor that can automatically detect when something is a, a talent versus when it's a, a charism. But there are people that just, it, it's clear to me, have certain gifts and, and kind of supernatural abilities that go beyond um, that, that manifest in, in, in any place I've been, in any community I've been. So, absolutely. What can one do, Kellyanne? Okay, so you, you clarified um, gifts versus charisms. Um, and by gifts, I, I think you mean more like abilities or talents, right? Um, to decipher the difference because they seem to blend together so much. And the, yes, there is blending. And that's the thing is, um, as I said, often, not always, but often, uh, charisms build upon or draw from the same sorts of things that are natural gifts and abilities draw from. What do I mean? First, I'll take go back to hospitality. That, that's a good one, right? Someone who's just a fantastic host or hostess for whether it's a dinner party in a home or again, whether it's an after parish mass coffee hour or a big parish celebration, a big party, a big event, uh, often the kind of person who's kind of around like making sure everything's great and people are welcome and feeling all, all that, often those people are naturally extroverted, right? They get energized by being around other people. Um, 
whether they know them or whether they don't know them. Sometimes even more energized around people they don't know, right? That's kind of the, the natural personality trait of being an, an extrovert. So often, those are the kinds of people that then the Holy Spirit gives this charism of hospitality to, precisely because it takes what's natural to them already and now is elevating it, right? This is, Spirit loves to elevate, elevating that to a whole nother. So, so the, the, you might say the natural fruitfulness someone might have in that kind of a role of being the welcomer at an event or whatever, just based on their gifts, now is even more fruitful um, because of this extra oomph that the Holy Spirit has, has brought to the table. Um, or again, you know, teaching as a charism. I didn't give that as one of the examples, but it is one of the examples. Um, again, someone can study, they can, they can learn material, they can have some basic skills in public speaking, and more or less put those things together, they're probably going to be at least a halfway decent teacher, probably. Um, and there's a lot more to it. I, maybe that's, that's too broad or too uh, limited a scope. But, but the point is, there's some people who have a natural ability to teach. And that's a great thing. And that can do a lot of good in a lot of students' lives. But then there's the teacher that 20 years later, every student remembers. The teacher that it, it was a life almost changing experience to be in that teacher's classroom. That's not just a human gift. I don't, I don't think. I think at some point when you have a teacher that has had that kind of influence on huge numbers of students, again, there, there's a fruitfulness there that we just can't explain by, by their talent or their skill level alone. Um, again, that's when it's, it's a sign, maybe that, that that's a charism of the Holy Spirit um, manifesting in their lives. So that's, I think, um, yeah, I think that's what I would say, say to that. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, and again, there's the subjective thing of what it does in the person. You know, something Sherry says in her book, and I don't know if I would go to the wall on this, but she's studied this a lot longer than I have and in a lot more detail than I have. But she says, if something is a true charism, you can never get burned out doing it because it's, it's actually life-giving, that the more you do it, it doesn't exhaust you, it actually energizes you more and more, um, which is a bold statement. I'm still thinking through that, um, although she does say things surrounding it can burn you out. So she said, actually teaching as an example in, in the book, she says, someone with a charism of teaching is never gonna get burned out teaching. Now they could get burned out in dealing with administration, um, and scheduling and all of that other stuff that surrounds being a teacher, that that can be draining to them. Um, but the actual act of teaching, when they're in the moment teaching, that that's going to be energizing, that that's one of the characteristics of, of a, a charism, is in the moment when we're doing the very thing that charism is meant for us to do, we are constantly being energized by doing it. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions I see for now. If I missed any, um, I apologize. I, I know I went late. I had about going late on these things, so I'm sorry for that. But anyway, um, we ready, set our glory be the end. So thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take probably a, a week or maybe a couple week break uh, from the talks, so and then we're going to be back with another series. Don't know what the series is yet, but as soon as we know it, we will let you know. So for now, good night. God bless. See you soon.